May 1949. The world was still wounded, profusely bleeding from the wound ripped open by World War II. And while Western Europe healed, eyes were fixed and preparations were made for a new potential threat. Though there were those who shared no love for communism during the Second World War, the Soviets were altogether often seen as allies of the West. But this friendly vision soon disappeared as Germany was divided amongst Britain, America, France and the Soviets. Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin extended his communist influence to many Eastern European countries like Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia and Eastern Germany to create a buffer zone in case a new invasion would arise. But at the same time, though World War II was over, the world was not without its wars. Civil war conflicts all around the globe arose, some created recently by communist revolutions, while others were rooted in decades before. In 1949, the Nuremberg trials finally came to an end after four years. Among other things, the 15 closest allies to Hitler, who were still alive, were sentenced to either death or life imprisonment. The only exception was Speer, who was the only one to show any remorse. He was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. Though the war was won four years ago, many European countries were still in the process of rebuilding and Britain was no exception. Prime Minister Clement Adelaide, who was in control since 1945, continued this path under the slogan Rebuilding Britain. With this particular program, construction speed should increase, factory outcome would be greater, and industrial research would flourish. New civilian factories were being planned out all over Britain, creating jobs, increased economy, and giving the British a sense of purpose again as they rose from the ashes of bombed out cities. Other countries that were part of the recently established NATO went through similar paths like the French Republic. President Vincent Auriol set forth the reconstruction not in the sense of creating necessarily more work, but in order to increase research to jumpstart the country for the upcoming 50s. France at that time was involved in the Indochina War, mostly fought in northern Vietnam, but also extending to places like Laos and Cambodia. Their opponents were the Communist Viet Minh and the People's Army of Vietnam. With the Chinese Civil War, a conflict that erupted long before World War II occurred, continuing in the favor of the Communist Mao Zedong, President Auriol feared that the Viet Minh would grow in support locally and through foreign connections with neighboring China. A call to arms by France was initialized to other NATO countries and their puppets. Countries like Britain, Luxembourg, Norway, Portugal, Iceland and Denmark agreed to join the conflict. Preparations for this would take time and many believed the merge of wars was purely to intimidate the anti-French parties in Vietnam. America refrained from the conflict as President Harry Truman currently focused on the American army alone. The Americans were still spread out around the globe and governmental issues had higher priority than lesser conflicts. Though Britain agreed to aid France in her time of need in Vietnam, Britain had her own share of problems with the communist uprisings. The Commonwealth was in conflict against the Malayan National Liberation Army that was the military arm of the Malayan Communist Party. On the side of the British fought the Federation of Malaya and the uprising for the time being seemed to be under control. Britain therefore could afford to send off an army towards nearby Vietnam. To speed up this process, South Rhodesia agreed on a land lease for infantry equipment with Britain. Then on June 6, 1949, word got out that Laos had capitulated. Sisafang Phong announced that their nation could no longer withstand the pressure from the occupying Vietnamese forces, committing travesties throughout the country. Laos's government had gone into exile. Their main forces had capitulated and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam was now in control of their home area. Though the war against the Democratic Republic of Vietnam continued, this was an unfortunate setback for all of NATO. For the moment, the only threat from the communist armies came from the north as the clashes in the south could easily be contained by the state of Vietnam. A British army under the lead of General William Slim was preparing in Britain to be sent out to Asia as word got out that several divisions of the MNLA had been surrounded in Malaya. The British, at the time, had troops everywhere, though not to the extent of America, and were also present in western Germany. India was also one of the countries coping with the civil war. Puchalapali Sundaraya, 
who was the head of the Marxist India People's Republic, stood at the foreground of a revolt emerging from Hyderabad. Though in the first months of the revolt, Sundaraya's allies gained numerous territories in multiple directions, their opposition was certain that over the coming weeks, they would be crushed once and for all. Mao Zedong's focus on his so-called liberation war seemed to pay off, as they took over territories and gained influence at a rapid pace. Opposition leader Chiang Kai-shek grew more paranoid with each passing day. He declared martial law, raining down hell on those showing even the slightest of implications leading towards Zedong's vision. But Russia was seen by many Western countries as the biggest possible threat. Yet no one dared to provoke the powerful sleeping bear being led with an iron fist of Stalin. The dictator issued reforms to secure his political power even more tightly after the war and within the new territories in Eastern Europe. The Federal Republic of Germany, commonly known as West Germany, was of course still in ruins after the war. Poverty and hunger weighed down hard on the German civilians, and the Western superpowers were afraid it was this exact poverty and hunger that would tempt the citizens of Western Europe towards supporting communism. In response, the Marshall Plan was created, a massive operation where the US gave over $13 billion to restore the Western European economy. Many countries like France, Denmark and Britain would profit from this. 18 countries in total accepted the Marshall Plan. Though the Soviet Union was offered the same plan, they refused, as did they prohibit the participation of Eastern European countries like Poland and Hungary, countries that could have used the plan in great need. Then halfway through June, the People's Democratic Republic of Malaya was finally defeated and their territory was retaken by Malaysia itself. British colonial administrator Henry Gurney was put at the forefront and instead of a direction of strengthening his own grip, he chose for a path of industry not worrying about a potential new uprising with Mother Britain behind his back. The Indochina War had in the north mostly focused on battles in and around Hanoi. Though the French troops were not losing men that much, they could sense that the tempo of the battles was determined by the enemy. News was released that in the Philippines the Hukbahalap rebellion had failed. The Philippines declared victory in putting down the rebellion and hunting down the last main forces. Those who escaped scattered into the mountains and did not abandon the rebellion. The Philippines and NATO have called this a victory in containing communism from spreading elsewhere in Asia. The Huk Bahalab have said they will return when the time comes again. But for now, the rebellion was over and peace in the Philippines was once more. Greece at this time also was still fighting a civil war since 1946 in what might be seen as the first proxy war of the greater conflict. The Greek government army that was backed by Britain and the US fought a communist insurgency by the Democratic Army of Greece. Many partisans, who fought against Italian and German occupation during World War II and were seen as heroes, were fighting for the communists and were now labeled as enemies fighting for the wrong cause. The war was coming to an end and it did not look good for the communist troops. Now that the Malayan emergency had been laid to rest, Britain could also start sending troops towards Vietnam from other Asian countries. Nearby Hong Kong was at the ready to ship over four divisions, but in the time fought, France lost its harbor at Hanoi, giving the British troops no way to reinforce. Because of this, the troops were ordered to land on the southern side near Saigon of the neighboring state of Vietnam. Then shortly after, news came out that the Kingdom of Cambodia had met with the same fate as Laos did. The Vietnamese forces were too strong, and the Cambodian government had collapsed. Where the failed rebellion in the Philippines lowered morale for communist supporters, Western leaders feared that the news of Laos and Cambodia would fuel those to pick up arms to fight at the communist side. But the bad news was soon forgotten, as the uprising in India was laid to waste, and Hyderabad was retaken as communism was stomped out. And then immediately following after, the French managed to pull off a victory over the communists in Vietnam. With word going around of British troops arriving and the news that their rebellion in the south had been broken, meaning that troops of the state of Vietnam would be heading north to flank as well, the Viet Minh and People's Army of Vietnam capitulated, returning their taken lands to French occupation. Nearby Japan was for the moment still under American military occupation, but word had it that they were in the process of handing over the authority as MacArthur overlooked the forming of the Japanese self-defense forces. Halfway through July, the Greek civil war finally came to an end. After three years and six months of fighting, Greece suffered 50,000 dead and its cities lay in ruins. Greece's economy was in bad shape 
and for the next decade, a stronger and more resilient Greece would need to be built. Though communism was seen as the new grand evil by Western media and politicians, the former evil labeled fascism was still around, but not to a matter of worrying significance. Spain was only looking inward, like it did during World War II, and other countries knew Franco did not have the strength to oppose a threat to any country backed by NATO. Where Germany was split into different areas with different governments, the same counted for Korea that was separated in North and South. Both different governments that claimed to be the legitimate government over all of Korea, as they did not accept the given divided border and did not see the divide as a permanent state. Though tensions could be felt, both governments at the moment focused solely on their own side, on rebuilding and reforming their land and cities. And so plotting behind the scenes commenced worldwide, far from the public eye. Boleslaw Beirut, who was at the head of the heavily Marxist-Leninism-influenced government, secretly supported the newly formed Socialist United People's Party of Poland. It was one of many secrets that country's government had in its global conflict that would jumpstart the entire world in a new era of philosophy, technological capability and warfare. <laughs>